Hi everybody, and welcome to, welcome to Building SaaS on AWS. My name is Derek Bingham. I am a developer advocate at AWS. And if you haven't seen Building SaaS on AWS before, this is a show that usually goes out um, at a different time zone entirely. And what we're doing, this is our first show that we're going out in a, a very much a APJ slash uh, West Coast of the US. Um, so time zone so that's what we're doing today and the show is all about building SaaS and aws so if you are have a SaaS solution like aws or you're thinking about building one this is the right show for you so today uh, i'm joined um by ananda and ben and we're going to talk through how uh, ben um used aws global accelerator to improve uh, some of the products that the Lassian offer but Rather than me talk about it, um, I'll, I'll let the, the, the fine gentlemen introduce themselves in a bit. Just to just to reiterate, this is your show, so questions just put pop them in the chat, and we'll try and answer them as we go. So I'll ask uh, Ben to introduce yourself, please. Yeah, thank you, Derek. I'm I'm really happy to be here today to talk about Global Accelerator. Uh, I'm from Sydney, Australia, and uh, my name is Ben, and I work in the Edge Networking Group at Atlassian and we're responsible for getting packets to and from customers' laptops and, and build pipelines to our um, to our infrastructure in AWS. Cool, cool. Thanks, Ben. Looking forward to hearing no all about of it in, in a minute. So next is uh, Ananda. Ananda, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Derek, and welcome, Ben. Hi, everybody. My name is Ananda Rajagopal, and I run product management for Global Accelerator in AWS. And just to show that this is specific time zone friendly, I'm in Cupertino, California here. <laughs> yes, nice, nice. Uh, good evening. I'm actually, I didn't mention this. I, I'm in Perth in Western Australia. So it's, it's good morning for me. And well, Ben, it's, it'll be a good afternoon from you as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yep, fantastic. So um, what we're going to do is we're go just going to go through, um, you know, how, how Ben at Atlassian, you were even, what sort of, um, problem you were trying to, to solve at Atlassian you know, and why, why we're here talking about that problem. Could you just um, go in, into a bit of detail, into, into a bit of depth of what Atlassian and the problems that Atlassian were, were facing and what we're trying to solve? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's kind of multifaceted. Um, anyone who's who's done SaaS or, or built a SaaS application before will know that solving distributed state and distributed storage around the world is, is really, really hard. Um, so we had a situation where we had a product which was honed in just one or two regions, but we wanted to improve the performance of that product, Bitbucket Cloud, for all of our customers all around the world. You know, we had a huge number of users in uh, in India and, and Asia and Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, and we, we weren't able to provide them the same experiences that North American customers were having in terms of speed of clone operations and interactions with the website. And we, we were looking for a way to improve on that. And it just so happened that Global Accelerator came along at the same time that we were looking into this problem and how we might fix it. And it really offered us a way to solve it without doing a number of like um, very, very difficult computer science challenges, um, like solving that huge distributed state, distributed storage problem. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, great, great. Well, um, if anybody uh, hasn't heard of what is this AWS Global Accelerator uh, that, that, that we're talking about, um, uh, Ben, I think Ananda is the right person to, to introduce us to it. Um, Ananda, can Absolutely. you introduce us to <laughs> what, what it is? Sure. So Global Accelerator is an AWS service that really offers the Amazon Global Network as um, a network that could be used to onboard client traffic for your internet facing workloads that are running on AWS. There's a couple of things to note here. First off, it is a global service, not a regional service, which means that you have access to any of the regions uh, in which Global Accelerator is supported. Uh, so typically when you have got internet facing workloads, uh, let's say you're running a workload in US East one, uh, the traffic from your clients um, reaches uh, US East one over the internet. What Global Accelerator does is to actually use one of the many edge locations that we have. Your client traffic gets onboarded to one of the edge locations, and then you can think of it as riding the freeway all the way up to wherever your regional endpoints are located. 
So the benefits translate into up to 60% improvement in performance, uh, increased availability. So this is a service that is built for 99.995% availability and also improved security, especially from the point of view of distributed denial of service guards in concert with Shield. The many other benefits and one of the most important things to talk about is uh, the fact that it is an any cast based service, which means that there is a global static IP that's provided to any user. So it doesn't matter if the user is coming from Perth or Sydney or Cupertino, we all get to use the same global static IP address as opposed to the regional uh, IP addresses, which is what the scope of a typical elastic IP address is. Yeah, nice, nice use of um, current locations of all the presenters, Ananda. Very good. Um, <laughs> Is, is it worth at this stage pushing up the uh, what the global backbone looks like? Are you going to uh, talk about that at a, at a later stage? Yeah, why don't you bring the tap? Let's yeah. let's show uh, what that looks like. So, so what you see here is kind of the Amazon global backbone. Um, so we've got up to 102 points of presence that are spread across 86 cities across 47 countries. Uh, we've added six this year, so this includes the updated count, and we continue to keep adding. Um, you know, more points of presence every year. So every time a new point of presence is added, we're kind of taking the Amazon network closer to where you as an application developer are expecting some of your clients to come in from. So if you are a game developer, for example, if you are a SaaS provider offering your applications to, uh, you know, folks who are far away from your region, um, you know, all of those would be situations where you get the benefit of the Amazon network. Awesome, awesome. Uh, just having a comment in, in about my sound. So if my sound's really low, I'll try and talk a bit, a bit louder. I'm not as loud as Ananda and Ben, so I'll try and be loud. If it's still a bit soft, let me know in the chat. But uh, yeah, sorry about my, my sound. It is it is early here in Perth. Um, so that's that's great, Ananda. Um, that's a good um, uh, bit of a background into a global accelerator and what it is and how it's deployed across the globe, which is very cool. Um, and just a, a bit of a, an insight into, into me in terms of, I'm, I'm a developer, so all this networking stuff um, when I, um, is, is so, you know, it's for other people's jobs. <laughs> but the, this global accelerator and getting uh, to know it over the last couple of days has been really, really fascinating uh, for me anyway. Um, so it's very cool. So you talked about endpoints, uh, Ananda. What, what types of endpoints um, uh, are supported by uh, Global Accelerator currently? Yeah, so maybe before I answer that, I'll perhaps give a little bit more context in terms of you know, why Global Accelerator came out came about to be, right? So you mentioned about you know how uh, SaaS developers go about building applications, and typically, uh, especially for those SaaS applications that are internet facing, uh, when customers want to deploy them globally, there are about four or five challenges that we constantly hear. You know, there's some that already were touched upon by Ben. Uh, the first one is to offer deterministic end user experience over the internet. And exactly as Ben mentioned, you know, customers could be coming from locations where perhaps internet connectivity is not as reliable uh, or doesn't have the same level of availability as certain others. Uh, so that determinism is a big one. The second one is the flexibility to build a single region or multi-region workloads. A lot of times uh, when one moves into SaaS, you know, you start off with single region, but you have kind of this long-term vision of moving to a multi-region workload. And over time, you start you know, building uh, your SaaS offering in other regions where you're kind of closer to where uh, a critical mass of your end users are. Uh, a consistent way to access the endpoints, you know, especially uh, with the example of the global static IP that I mentioned, and fast failover across those endpoints you know, without having any DNS dependency. So a big problem that we see from many, many um, independent software vendors and other um, uh, application providers is that they often find that the client or perhaps an intervening ISP is caching the DNS. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, you know, connectivity gets uh, affected. And so that lack of availability becomes a challenge in terms of an accessing it. And of course, you know, denial of service uh, prevention is, is also you know, super key. So to address these is why we came about uh, building Global Accelerator. Obviously, the big question then is that what kinds of endpoints would be supported as you mentioned? 
So generally what we see happening is that customers deploy either one of the Amazon offered load balancers, such as the application load balancer or the network load balancer, or they might decide to use a third party load balancer running directly on an EC2 instance, or perhaps directly using um, Global Accelerator as a load balancer to route to EC2 instances. Yep. We also support Elastic IP. So those are the four types of endpoint supported, network load balancer, application load balancer, EC2 instance, and Elastic IP. Cool, and before I ask Ben uh, what endpoints at Lasting are using, um, how do you go about monitoring and, and being active, proactive about failures of these endpoints, Ananda? Yeah, so we run health checks, um, you know, on each of these endpoints and uh, I'm getting a little bit into the details here, but maybe it's worthwhile to point it out. There are two types of accelerators, one called a standard accelerator and another called a custom routing accelerator. For the time being, let's stay with the standard one and we'll get to custom routing later on if time permits. Um, for any standard accelerator, uh, Global Accelerator automatically uh, runs the health checks for um, endpoints and only routes traffic to healthy endpoints. So if it is an EC2 instance, um, you know, we're running route 50 health checks from every edge location to every single uh, endpoint to make sure that uh, that endpoint is healthy. And if that endpoint is unhealthy, we route traffic away from that to one of the remaining healthy endpoints. Um, so, so that is kind of the core of how it is done. Um, for ALB and NLB, uh, the route 53 health checks that are reported um, by ALB, uh, uh, the ALB and NLB health that is reported by Route 53 is what is used by um, Global Accelerator to make the routing decisions. Cool, cool, awesome. Uh, thanks for that. Um, just my curiosity. Um, so Ben, what sort of endpoints are you currently using in Atlassian um, for, with Global Accelerator? Oh, yeah, thanks, Derek. We, we, oh, yeah. Well, we we actually evaluated looking at whether we would terminate Global Accelerator directly on our existing NLB. Um, uh, we we had a look into that. There, there's uh, there's a mode that Global Accelerator has, which Ananda referred to, where it can talk directly to EC2 instances, and that was really good for us because it could preserve the IP address. It can do that as well for NLB, but. But the amazing thing, and I don't know if AWS will like me to say this, but if you go directly to your EC2 instances, you actually avoid the additional costs of transferring through the NLB. So we were able to actually offset the um, the costs of Global Accelerator with avoiding the traffic on the NLB, and that made it a much better business prospect I could sell internally. Yeah, nice, nice. I, I, I think uh, AWS loves builders. We're all builders. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so you but it was very easy to do. It was very yeah. easy to do. Nice. Cool. Um, so, Ananda, we did touch touch on on cost there. Maybe miss the time just to just to briefly um, uh, talk about the cost of uh, uh, of Global Accelerator while we're here. Yeah, I'm going to go through every single cell of the <laughs> nine by nine matrix. Not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, so, this, this, this show is only an hour, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so basically uh, there is a charge. Uh, so think of this as you got your standard EC2 data transfer out charge. Uh, the pricing for Global Accelerator is based on what we call as a dominant direction. So whichever is more dominant, whether it is ingress or whether it is egress, that is you know, sampled, uh, every, that is measured every, every single uh, hour. And it's only the dominant direction that gets billed. So which means that if the ingest is more dominant than the egress, the ingest would get billed. If the egress is more dominant, the egress would get billed. Uh, as you know, data transfer in, the standard data transfer in, in AWS is free of charge. The, sta the data transfer out has got a certain charge that we often call as EC2 DTO. So the pricing for AG would be an add-on to EC2 DTO. And that price depends on effectively, you can think of it as the distance that is traveled over the AWS backbone, right? So that's the simplest way to think about that. Uh, whether it is in region, uh, in geographic region, I'm sorry. So whether it's, for example, in North America or in APAC or in Australia, for example, there'd be a certain rate. And then based on where the destination is, and if you're going from, let's say, Australia to uh, North America, there would be a different rate. So on our page, and I'll post that uh, link shortly, 
you know, we've got a detailed breakdown in terms of what the price looks like. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Frank, for doing that in, in a short time as well. Fantastic. And then uh, um, the next question I have is, um, so ben, ben touched on um, how he could um, go direct to his uh, ALB, um, but why not just use an NLB and an ALB directly in front of uh, any uh, internet facing workload? Yeah, so certainly you, you, you absolutely can use um, NLB or ALB. Uh, and in many situations, that's perfectly acceptable too. As you know, in AWS, we like to offer as many options as possible for customers based on what is uh, the right use case for them. Um, many times when customers want to reach a global uh, customer base, uh, they want to make use of the Amazon backbone, right? So that's one of the reasons why, why we offered that. So the first benefit there is that you can actually have things like denial of service guards that uh, kick in at the edge of the infrastructure as opposed to, you know, in, in the region. In, in the region. So that's yeah. one big benefit. The second one is that um, whenever we talk about um, ALB or NLB, those are regional services. Um, but you may still need to kind of find a way to balance traffic across multiple regions. So for multi-region situations is where uh, having AGA, um, AWS Global Accelerator, I'm sorry, I use the term AGA. That's one of our favorite three-letter acronyms that we use here <laughs> instead of AWS. Uh, so Global Accelerator can be used as a front end uh, to balance across multiple ALB endpoints or multiple NLB endpoints, right? A third one is the scope of the IP address. So NLB, for example, supports a static IP address, but that has got a regional scope. Uh, so uh, whereas the same IP address, for example, can be used globally with Global Accelerator. So those would be, I would say, some of the top three reasons in terms of why uh, one would consider uh, using Global Accelerator. And as Ben said, the customers who uh, uh, use uh, Global Accelerator directly with EC2 instances, and there are many others who use it in different ways. You know, there are many customers, for example, who like the global static IP and front end and ALB with a global accelerator. In fact, that's one of the most popular uh, deployments where they get the benefits of ALB and they also get the benefit of static IP and all the other things that I mentioned. And the other situations where both global accelerator and uh, NLB uh, are used, uh, wherein NLB would be used as an endpoint. In those situations, typically the benefits would be in terms of the global static IP, um, you know, the protection that is done at the edge of the infrastructure. Um, you now we can talk later on about some of the distributed denial of service guards that are that are in place. Um, and last but not the least, using the Amazon backbone, right? So you're not kind of riding that internet, um, uh, what I call as the country roads of the internet <laughs> to get to <laughs> the, the endpoint where nice. you're kind of using the highway. Yes, you're not riding on your cart along the comfy roads. Like, <laughs> like it, like it, Ananda. That's the first time I've heard that. Um, yeah, great, great, great summary of the different options. I think I think we spent enough time talking about about the uh, AGA uh, service, Amazon, uh, Amazon Global Accelerator. It's now talk, time to talk about implementation, uh, Ben. Uh, so we're really, uh, and the reason we're here is obviously to, to understand uh, the implementation that Atlassian did and the implementation that you did. Uh, if people have just joined the show, uh, now's your chance to ask questions. Just put them in the chat. We're here to answer answer all of your questions. So uh, please put um, questions in the chat. But while people are thinking about a question to ask, Ben, could you just maybe start with maybe describing uh, the technical architecture, and I know there's a diagram that I'll push up for you as well. Thanks. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, so Bitbucket Cloud is one of Atlassian's um, major major products. Uh, it's a code and CI CD pipeline that's used by developers all around the world. Um, and the the speed of those uh, code deployments and operations and build pipelines all depends on how fast we can deliver. Um, uh, get operations back and forth from the clients and from our servers. So Global Accelerator helps speed all that up. But as well as being a code pipeline, it's also uh, it's a website where you can actually edit the code, you can annotate, you can do pull requests, you can manage your bugs and things like that. So we want to speed up that human experience as well. And Global Accelerator works worked for us on port 22 and port 443. 443 and I'll talk about why that's important again in a moment. But 
the the legacy network architecture of Bitbucket was basically we we had one region uh, as our primary, one region as our secondary in North America. Our primary region was US East One, where I think a lot of different companies have their primary region for their applications. And we had an NLB in front of our uh, EC2 based um, load balancers and, and data brokers. And what what we were finding was that a lot of customers out of Europe and South America, Asia Pacific, particularly Eastern Europe, it seemed, um, they would run into problems where I think as Ananda called it, um, packets take the country roads of the internet. and. We were we were actually having from this problem they were they were encountering packet loss sometimes uh, uh, you know it wouldn't even be their own enterprise network engineering team but sometimes those ISPs would block port 22 and things like that upstream from them maybe two or three ISPs away from them we were having a lot of these really weird networking issues and anyone on the call anyone listening who's troubleshot networking issues before knows that it's really really hard and when it's three hops away from you and three hops away from the customer buried deep in the internet, it's even harder. Sometimes you just can't find anyone to fix it. So we really wanted to solve this, this load overhead on our support team and for our customers. Um, so that was really important to us at that time. And, and having them go across the entire internet to reach uh, US East One was, was not really working well for us. So this is where Global Accelerator came in. Um, it was going to it was going to and did lower our support overhead, which has been fantastic, but it also sped things up for our customers, right? Like, um, you know, we're always looking for ways to speed up our products. And, uh, and this was, this was a way that just seemed like a no brainer as we'll, as we'll get into. So after we introduced global accelerator, we still had our primary backend in us East one, but now with global accelerator, we're able to leverage those 200 plus um, network edge locations that Ananda mentioned. And customers are, are only usually maybe one, two, three, four, five routers away from those edge locations, not, not many multiple ISPs away. So their traffic, their traffic follows an any casted static uh, IP address, uh, hits one of those edge locations, and then Amazon takes over for you and Amazon transports that those, those requests and those responses across their private backbone, as Ananda mentioned. And I guess what we found, I'll, I'll give it away now, is that our, our support load for network issues related to our SaaS products just dropped to almost zero, right? So it was it was a really amazing outcome for us. But um, there were a few other things. So uh, a few of the requirements that we had for Global Accelerator, and it ticked all the boxes for us, is that we needed dedicated IP space. Now, that's not so important for um, some SaaS applications on the internet especially ones that people are using on their mobile phones and things like that. But for, for Bitbucket, we had a lot of enterprise customers and even smaller SMB customers and individuals who said, I only want to open port 22 on my firewall out to a single IP address. And I don't want Bitbucket moving IP addresses all the time. And it didn't historically, and we needed to maintain that. Um, and Global Accelerator stepped in and absolutely had that, that solution for us. You can have a static IP address. We were even able to bring our own IP address space, which we had um, uh, been assigned by Aaron. So we didn't need to borrow IP address space from AWS. We were able to use our own IPs, which is a fantastic feature. Um, the next thing that we needed support on was the ability to open up arbitrary IP, um, sorry, ports. Now, CloudFront, CloudFront only supports HTTP, but Git uses SSH over port 22. It can use it can use it over other ports as well, but fundamentally, it by default tries to speak over port 22. And we wanted to speed up that experience as well on the same IP address as our HTTP um, uh, uh, applications. And so, Global Accelerator allows you to use any port you like. Right? It accelerates it accelerates your conversations at a TCP level. Um, it, it doesn't try to do what CloudFront does, which is only accelerate HTTP traffic. So that was a really big benefit for us. And then last of all, as part of changing this network architecture, although it looks really different there in that, in that, that diagram, actually we, we wanted to do something for our customers that involved um, a very short space of engineering time and didn't require really big backend or front-end changes that customers would feel or our backend teams would need to do a lot of work on. Like we didn't really want to bother our application developers. As a network team, we wanted to offer this benefit to our, our product team and to our customers with minimal overhead. 
And we were able to actually complete this project. I think it only took us like two weeks. Um, and, and a lot of that was just doing very minimal incremental DNS changes as we rolled out the percentage of traffic going to Global Accelerator. The, the actual coding, the actual um, turning it on, maybe took less than a day. So amazing, amazing product. Nice, very, very cool. And um, yeah. was there any while you were while you were implementing um, this change uh, over like the time frame is, is blows my mind. Um, so yeah. so quick. Um, was there any um, <laughs> <laughs> was there any best practices that you adopted along the way? Any uh, you know uh, gotchas that you found when you're when you're implementing it um, that you could talk about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, th there's actually a few. Uh, some of them are really interesting. So the first of all, like just, just as a recommendation, you can manage your global accelerator through the AWS console or AWS CLI or even the Bodo 3 library. That's all fine. We, we use those all the time. But infrastructure as code is the way you really want to manage your global accelerator using something like CloudFormation, which is fully supported. Um, I, I don't know if I know to mention it, but that's that's been great for us. So we can make our changes and we can roll them out to a staging global accelerator, which points at our staging bit bucket. And then we can roll those changes out to production and affect our production um, global accelerator. And it's all managed as code. It goes through peer review. It's it's beautiful end to end, right? Um, the, what was I going to say? Yep. The second thing I mentioned it earlier is as we were rolling out that global accelerator endpoint, we, we were pretty confident about the, the benefit and the experience that it would bring to customers would be only beneficial. But in this kind of job, we're never 100% certain. So we used Route 53 to uh, um, use a weighted record to gradually push traffic onto Global Accelerator. So we went like 10% per day over about two business weeks. And that was really nice. And we, we didn't encounter any incidents or any problems during the entire rollout, which was absolutely you know, wonderful, right? Um, what, what else? What else? So one of the things to be really mindful of with, um, uh, with computers, it's not an AWS specific problem, it's not a global accelerator specific problem, is that if you have a single client potentially or clients behind a network, uh, a NAT, a network address translation router, which probably everyone here has at home um, or at their corporate headquarters or at their office in their data centers, is that if you have clients behind that NAT speaking to um, uh, a resource on the other side of the internet that is behind two different IP addresses, you can actually get this thing called port collision, particularly if those IPs are forwarded to the same uh, destination port, right? This is a really, um, a really annoying issue to troubleshoot. If you're a network engineer, it can result in both clients receiving TCP resets. And it's, it's kind of inexplicable until you dig apart it, dig it apart in Wireshark. So, so the, the recommendation that we make, and I think Ananda will, will make as well, is that you dedicate a listener on your load balances, you dedicate a listener on your EC2 instances to only receive um, Amazon Global Accelerator traffic only. It shouldn't receive traffic from anywhere else. And I would absolutely make the same recommendation if you have multiple ALBs or multiple NLBs pointing at the same backend infrastructure. You should always make sure that you have multiple ports dedicated to each front end IP address or load balancer that Amazon represents to the internet for you. So this will help prevent that port collision issue. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the great, um, um, you know, uh, how to's and things to be querying and, and thinking about when, when you implement sure. uh, Amazon Global Accelerator. Maybe we'll come back to that. I think I think I think viewers will probably be interested in you know the benefits. What what happened? So we've Absolutely. seen you know how you implemented um, the change, a very short time window. Some of the the things yeah. and, and that you came across while you were doing it. Well, what, but what sort of benefits? What happened at the end? How did it how did it come out? Oh, uh, it, look, it went really well. We might jump to the next slide then, where we yep. can show off some of these statistics. Um, so. So this is this is just from my laptop. Uh, I'm pointing at the old NLB. You can see from Sydney, Australia, I'm getting uh, there in the, the red circle. I was getting about 4.71 megabits per second. Uh, sorry, megabytes per second, um, which is which is pretty dismal. It's 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 not that great. Um, uh, but I'm I'm kind of privileged to live in Sydney and, and have have cable internet. 
a lot of our customers were many, many, many further hops away from AWS than I am today here in Sydney, particularly our customers in, in parts of India and, and, and parts of Eastern Europe. So they were receiving maybe like one megabyte per second or something like that, which is just atrocious. So uh, after, after Global Accelerator, you can see that my speed went up significantly. So I went up to seven megabytes per second. This, maybe it's not blowing anyone's socks off, um, but we have another slide, if I, I think if we jump ahead, if that's okay, Derek. Um, actually, we might go to the, we might go one more and we'll come back to this one. So these, these are the actual speeds that we recorded. So we use a product called Thousand Eyes, which, which basically emulates customers all around the world in, in all sorts of different countries and ISPs. And these are the real um, HTTP server throughput numbers that we measured increased in blue uh, after turning on Amazon Global Accelerator. So you can see there for parts of Africa, they went from effectively maybe a few megabits per second up to 40. Um, uh, in Europe, speeds more than doubled, right? So we're looking at absolutely amazing uh, uplifts in throughput, which means decreased clone times, decreased pull times, decreased push times for our customers all around. But we also turned it on for our um, our HTTP website, right, for bitbucket.org, because you know a lot of people interact with that day to day as well. We didn't want these these benefits just to be for operations that are mostly used by machines. We want it to be experienced by humans as well. So, sorry, Derek, I'll ask you to go back to the previous slide. Is this is so, this the slide you're looking for? That's the slide. Yeah, this is the slide <laughs> I'm looking for. Um, um, yeah. So, so you know, one of the one of the things that we measure is is how fast our website is to uh, to users all around the world. And after turning on Amazon Global Accelerator, we saw our P90 response, to our total load time for our our first page that customers load that dropped by like 800 milliseconds. Right. Uh, in some cases, it dropped by the mean dropped by 600 milliseconds. These are outstanding, outstanding decreases in. Um, in uh, in latency in response latency for a web application, and you know other uh, I think other people who have worked on SaaS know that to get these kind of improvements just from a network change um, is pretty amazing, and to get equivalent performance improvements from from changing your front end code to changing your JavaScript would take many many months and take dozens of engineers potentially. So we were really outstanding, like surprised by how good it went. Yeah, that's a fantastic outcome. Uh, when I was when you sent those those graphs through, I was like, "Whoa, that's <laughs> that, that's pretty Absolutely. cool." Absolutely, uh, it's fantastic. Um, so that's um, so we've, we've talked through what we've talked through. We've talked through um, what Global Accelerator is, how you implemented it, the time frame, the, the short time frame you were able to achieve it in. The some yeah. of the you know best practices that you that you that you um, encountered along the way and some of the, some of the gotchas as well. Um, was was there any um, anything else you'd like to add al along those lines, or it, it, as well as that, you know, any future plans? Because obviously, it, it was a sure. great a great outcome. What, what how would you intend to use the the service going forward with your SaaS applications? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I might I might answer add one more thing first, and then talk about yep. our plans for awesome. the future, um, I, I, which I is that. I and <laughs> no, that, that's okay. Um, I, I forgot something. <laughs> Ananda's team at Global Accelerator, you know, we told them we want to use a different port on our load balances, and uh, we don't want to have to spin up a, a whole new set of load balances, but we want to still expose port 22. So we want to expose SSH on port 22 to our clients, and then on our load balances, we want to allocate maybe port 22, 23 or 24 or 122 to uh, to Global Accelerator, and and this feature is actually now supported by Global Accelerator. You can map external ports differently to internal ports. So I just want to thank Ananda for implementing that feature. It's it's available for everyone to use. It's it it basically solved that port collision issue and made the whole thing easier to reason about. Um, uh, the other thing that we're doing with Global Accelerator is we're, we're using those weight dials that are available for endpoints. So we can control the amount of traffic going to different endpoints over time. So if we make a change, we can test that change out on a very small amount of traffic. Um, and not, you know, as opposed to an NLB, where once you add a target to an NLB, boom, it gets 100% of traffic, you know, uh, which is a bit of a downside. ALBs have that dial as well, but it's really good to have it for uh, TCP level traffic on Global Accelerator. And for the future, you know, one of the things that Global Accelerator will hopefully unlock for us is that as 
as our backend team, as our Bitbucket development team, um, begin to solve those problems around distributed state, uh, multi-region capabilities, distributed storage and caching in multiple regions, we'll actually be able to um, hide the complexities of that from our users. They won't see any new IP addresses. They won't see any new, um, uh, they won't have to change the settings on their firewalls. They will, they will just see the same uh, Bitbucket, but faster as we do those backend improvements. And we'll be able to choose regions and dial up traffic on them as we do that rollout over time. So that's that's really great. It means, you know, I'm, I'm always scared of touching DNS. I think anyone who works on SaaS <laughs> is scared of touching DNS. Global Accelerator lets us just tune a, a single dial as we roll that out. It's going to be it's going to be really nice. Nice, nice. Yes, DNS, there be dragons. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's great, Ben. Some great insights. Uh, I just, uh, we've got a few more people joining us. So just as a bit of an overview of what you're seeing here on the AWS official Twitch channel, uh, we're talking building SaaS on AWS. And in today's episode, we're talking to Ben from Atlassian and how um, they implemented uh, Amazon Global Accelerator. Uh, to speed up uh, Bitbucket workloads and have a, a great outcome. So, so welcome to the channel. Um, that's great, Ben. Uh, so I'll probably go to the next um, question back to Ananda and uh, all around uh, availability. So as we know, availability is key for many, uh, well, for all SaaS builders, uh, because that that is what it's all about. So how does um, uh, Global Accelerator help with m maximizing that availability, Ananda? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that has increasingly become, you know, one of the probably the most important topics. Um, and many times for enterprises in particular, or even for many large SaaS providers, um, the primary reason why they seriously consider Global Accelerator. Uh, first off, this is a, a distributed system, right? Uh, when you think about the different edge locations that are across uh, the globe, along with the multiple regions across which traffic could be distributed to. The global accelerator is like a true distributed system, which means that there's no real single point of failure. I kind of step through some of the things that we do there that provides this 99.995% availability that I spoke about earlier on. Uh, if you look at any, uh, if you look at the overall architecture, um, and I'm going to geek out a little bit on networking here for, for just uh, uh, 30 seconds or so before getting back on topic here. If you must. Uh, we, <laughs> so we, uh, Global Accelerator is based on something called as Anycast uh, in networking. And what that means is that uh, it's a type of um, network addressing and routing methodology where you can have a single destination address that has got multiple routing paths uh, to the backend uh, or, or to what we call as the endpoints. And the benefit of that is that uh, you can actually have multiple edge locations that are all advertising the same IP address. And in the back end, you can actually route that to your specific endpoints, like the ALB endpoint or the network load balancer uh, uh, you know, endpoint, et cetera. Um, so uh, the benefit of that is that no single um, edge point of presence becomes a single point of failure. As an example, in Australia, we've got um, edge locations in Perth, we've got it in um, Melbourne, and we also have it in Sydney. Hypothetically assume that something happens and let's say the data center where uh, the Melbourne location, uh, uh, Melbourne pop is located, you know, something happens to that and, you know, uh, customers in Melbourne can no longer access the Melbourne pop. Because of the feature of any cast, without any changes, uh, the next closest pop would be Sydney. And so the Melbourne users would now get picked up by the Sydney edge location. And the traffic from the end users would, from the Melbourne end users would now travel over the internet up to the Sydney pop. And then from Sydney pop uses the Amazon network infrastructure. So that is, a benefit right there. You can think of these 102 different locations as each of them provides kind of a smaller blast radius, so to say, in terms of failure. Now, even within a single point of uh, presence, um, we use what is called as a network zone. So every global accelerator, whenever you configure a global accelerator, there are two IP addresses that are provided. And each IP address uh, maps to what is called as a network zone. 
everybody is familiar with the concept of an availability zone in a region. Uh, no region of AWS has got a single availability zone. Every one of them has got at least two, not three, and some have got up, up to six. Uh, and the reason is because they've got completely isolated resources so that there is uh, no failure of one availability zone that can affect an entire region. In the same way, a network zone is an isolated set of hardware which contains the uh, necessary uh, protocol stacks for processing each IP address and the two network zones are completely independent. So if one network zone gets affected, it doesn't affect uh, the availability of the second network zone. So that's another example of what we do to, to maximize the availability. Uh, we spoke earlier in terms of uh, the endpoint health checks that are done. So from every single edge location to every single uh, availability zone, we are constantly running health checks. And for EC2 endpoints, we're also running health checks using Route 53 health checkers uh, from uh, each edge location. So every edge location, uh, the global accelerator software is aware about what is a healthy endpoint and what is not. And in the event that there is an unhealthy endpoint, traffic gets routed away uh, from that to one of the remaining uh, healthy endpoints uh, in that endpoint group. Uh, endpoint group, by the way, translates to an AWS region. It's kind of just a grouping of endpoints in a single AWS region. So those are some of the things that we do to maximize uh, availability. And uh, you know, customers can make use of this. Uh, what I especially love is the multi-region capabilities, where you can actually, you know, provide, uh, you know, create um, modes of failover uh, in the event of uh, things such as maybe you want to move traffic away from one region to another. You can use this thing called traffic dials to gradually shift traffic away to another region when you're doing things like maintenance, for example, or even when you've got you know, situations that require you know, traffic to be to be moved away. So those are, I would say, some of the top capabilities when it comes to uh, availability. It's a huge area of, of investment for us and interest for us. And you know, uh, we always recommend the customers use both the IP addresses so that way they get the maximum amount of availability that yeah. we've designed the service for. Awesome, thanks, Ananda. Uh, I know Ben, you talked quite a, quite a bit about um, availability and the, the, using the dials before. But is there anything you want to dive a little bit deeper on in terms of uh, how you implemented and improved uh, availability um, by using um, Global Accelerator, uh, say compared to DN DNS as, as an example? Um, anything you'd like to touch on there? No, I think Ananda really covered it really well. We we use the dials. Um, uh, we have multiple global accelerators pointing at different environments, so we can we can do testing before we roll things out. Um, I don't really want to add anything to what Ananda said. I think he covered everything. It's it's actually beautifully straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And uh, it's nice when 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 things just work, isn't it? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> So I'm just going to ask you a few questions around um, uh, this as well. So um, in my mind, apart from uh, using the AWS Global Infrastructure, what, what other optimi optimizations do you do to improve uh, performance? Yeah, so uh, we do one of the most popular features that is enabled by default is called as TCP termination. Right. Um, so a lot of workloads are often HTTP workloads or other TCP based workloads. Um, and for those kinds of workloads, we have implemented this feature, which is effectively a TCP proxy. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier on in the using the networking lingo, um, a global accelerator operates at uh, layer four in the, in the OSI model. So it's really a TCP UDP uh, based service. Um, for TCP specifically, we have implemented this capability called TCP termination. And uh, you can think of it as a TCP proxy that runs on the edge of the infrastructure. So whenever a client initiates a TCP connection, rather than, I'm going to use the same example of the Melbourne user trying to access uh, an endpoint in US East 1. Rather than the TCP connection taking that long path of several thousand miles, before you know the act for that initial sin packet comes back uh, the initial response comes back from the edge location in melbourne itself so the there's a 
there's kind of a, a fast response to that TCP session setup. And in parallel, Global Accelerator sets up another session back to the endpoint, right? So that's one way in terms of how uh, the TCP uh, handshake happens faster. And in addition to that, along with uh, the fast handshake, we also do other optimizations such as use of jumbo frames so that more content can be packed into the payload. Uh, we also do things such as uh, you know uh, an extended uh, congestion window so that way uh, you can we can scale up the the TCP congestion window for to send larger amounts of data. Uh, there's also a lot la larger receive window size and other TCP buffers that are used in the system. So all of this collectively means that you can get up to about 60% uh, improvement in terms of throughput. I'm going to paste uh, a link here which uh, you know, is worth sharing uh, with everybody that talks about you know some of the uh, the benefits in terms of how we are able to achieve. Uh, the, the benefits for TCP termination. No problem. I will share that. No problem. So while, while I'm doing that, uh, and, and uh, the next the next question that comes to mind is all around security. So uh, are there any additional security benefits for using a global accelerator? Right. So the third, you know, uh, leg of the of the tripod, so to say, in terms of the benefits we offer is security and specifically with respect to distributed denial of service guards, right? So uh, we work closely with Shield. Uh, Shield is a distributed denial of service um, uh, offered by AWS, and one of the resources, one of the many resources pr protected by Shield, is Global Accelerator. So what this means is that things such as detection of malformed packets, uh, things such as SYN flood attacks, um, ACT flood attacks, uh, those kinds of attacks are mitigated right at the edge, uh, including, uh, you know. Uh, kicking in the necessary rate limiters when uh, a denial of service attack is, is detected. Um, for Shield Advanced customers, there's also other, you know, uh, custom mitigations that can be put in place uh, based on the type of attack vector, which is a really good benefit that that customers can can avail of, so that uh, the legitimate end users' traffic is not affected. I would say that one of the biggest things to note there is that uh, we can actually do these things at the edge as opposed to kind of carrying it all the way back to region right the other one is that because of the fact that um, the customers are interacting now with global accelerator as opposed to uh, the ec2 instance uh, you know eip for example or maybe an alb public ip address or an nlb public ip address you can now actually place those into a private subnet right and that's a so those endpoints can now be placed in a private subnet so for some yeah. of our financial customers, that's actually been a really big one uh, where they say, you know, I trust the fact that, you know, we can use things like security groups and, you know, network firewalls or other third party firewalls. But if you can actually put them in a private subnet, hey, there's nothing better than that. Right. Yeah. So uh, that is a, a pretty attractive thing in terms of how customers use that uh, capability to you know, have better security in their AWS implementation. Yeah, when I when I read about that, oh. yeah. So you go, Ben. Ben, I, I just I just got to go. I was just going to say when I when I read about that capability, it blew my tiny mind. But yeah, Ben, sorry. <laughs> I, I I just want to confirm everything Ben and Andrew has just said. After we put Amazon Global Accelerator in front of uh, Bitbucket.org, we actually saw the amount of like garbage traffic or abuse traffic just drop off a cliff. All those TCP floods, and we, we, you know, we had AWS Shield Advanced in region on the in-region edge uh, in US East One and, and our other regions, but we still received a lot of tra uh, a lot of this uh, garbage traffic and, and port scanning and things like that, even with tight security groups and tight controls on our NLB. Um, once we put Global Accelerator in front, all of that almost pretty much disappeared. I don't, I don't think, you know, I'm not asking anyone to go do this, but. But we've had uh, very little traffic abuse on on the bucket since we put Global Accelerator in front. So thank you for that. Nice. Um, so we're um, we're going to wash up now. Well, rush, rush up. Um, I'm just waiting if anybody has any questions in the chat. Um, we're running out of time, um, but I'd like to um, thank Ananda and Ben for uh, an insightful chat around. Um, Global Accelerator. I certainly learned a lot um, from from this episode and researching it and, and, and spending some time with you folks. So I really appreciate um, 
you coming on, Ben, in particular, and, and sharing your implementation details and, and how you used um, uh, Global Accelerator. Uh, and thanks, thanks. No problem, no problem at all. And next time in Sydney, we should uh, we should catch up. <laughs> yeah, uh, have, have a beer. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> you read my mind. Uh, and then, Nanda, really nice to, to have you on as well and go through the, the intricate intricate details of, of Global Accelerator. Thanks, thanks for thanks for jumping on. Anytime. It's it's glad that we have a an APAC and Pacific um, time zone friendly in a version of this Twitch series and look forward to more. And thanks, Ben, for the partnership and also for coming today. Awesome. No problem. Uh, Thank just, you, Ananda. Thanks. I'm just going to, speaking of what, which I've, I've prepared a survey, which I'll, I'll, I'll put into the chat. Um, if anybody has some feedback on what they want to see in this new version um, of um, this show in an APAC friendly um, time, then please fill in the survey. I'll also post it there. Um, I know it's a really terrible URL. I'll work on getting the QR code. Um, please give us some feedback, what you'd like to see in the show, um, any particular use cases uh, that you'd like to see, and we would we'd really appreciate that. So, so thanks, uh, everybody. Um, I'll just wrap up now, and um, hopefully we'll see you again for the next episode which is scheduled for the 24th or it's three weeks uh, from now, uh, I believe. Uh, so watch the space, um, reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn or and I'll post the details of, of the next episode. So without any further ado, I'll say cheerio everybody. And uh, thanks, thanks for uh, joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks all, bye. Thanks, Derek, Ben. Thank you.